Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this Kongsberg Maritime webinar on future-proof container vessels. I would like to thank everyone for taking the time to join us here today to hear how Kongsberg can address some of the industry challenges that we, are, that we see in the container market. Some information about uh, the setup of our webinar today. We will start with a 25-minute uh, presentation where I, Oskar Levander, and my colleague, Paul Fredrik Jerpe, who also works for the business concept team, uh, will present some of, of uh, Kongsberg's solution for the container market. This is followed by a, a question answer session led by Leif Christian Veum, senior sales manager for the container market. In order for us to have a fruitful discussion, I please urge you to write in questions during the presentation. Please use the, the Q&A feature of the Zoom app to write in these questions. And we will answer them at the end of the webinar. So with that, I think we are ready to start the show. You can say that despite the fact that the container market is at an all time high, and we have record level freight late, levels out there, there are still some challenges that uh, the industry need to address. The main one is probably around sustainability and the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and of course, it's also about complying with the current regulation on CO2 emission, such as the efficiency design index and the carbon intensity index. And I think uh, emissions are also an important part for the second challenge, which is about future, future proofing the vessels. We see a big desire to invest in new tonnage uh, today with the high freight levels out there. But it's not easy to know what to invest in. Uh, what kind of ship will be competitive in today's market, but still able to comply with upcoming uh, requirements for reduced emission levels and low carbon fuels? Uh, when the market is hot, you want, to, want the ship to be operational all the time and available. So reliability is also high on the agenda. And we should never forget cost. Even though the revenues are high, there is a fierce competition out there and uh, a cost reduction is always welcome. So what can we at Kongsberg Maritime offer? In this presentation, we will show how we can help to address some of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. We will show um, that our solution can reduce CO2 with 15 to 30 percent already at the start. And we will also present our approach for future proof vessel that is competitive today but can be upgraded to really achieve low emissions and operate on low carbon fuels. And we will also pre present uh, uh, our ability to reduce operating cost and especially focus on fuel savings. Uh, we at Kongsberg, we have a very wide portfolio of products suitable for the container industry. And we do not have time to go through all of them here in the webinar today. But just to give you a slight overview of, of what we have, uh, you can say that we have pretty much everything related to the automation and control of these vessels. Um, in addition, we have propulsion in the form of propellers. Uh, we have the propulsion train with uh, electric motor drives and switchboards. Um, also the steering uh, is something we can offer in combination with uh, deck machinery, such as mooring and anchor winches. And as a leading digital uh, company in the marine sector, we have our own digital platform, Vessel Insight where we can provide both our own and third party apps for the operator to help improve the operational efficiency. And all this is supported by our service organization that has got a global service network to be able to assist our customers all around the world. But we should not forget that we also developed a capability to support the customers with remote solutions uh, without the need for sending people around the world. And if, if the customer wants, we can extend this uh, support in the form of, of 
life cycle agreement, uh, we, which we call extended fleet care. But the core for Kongsberg is really about integrating. So what we do and where we bring the most value is about integrating all these uh, uh, products and components into a holistic solution that we have truly optimized with extensive studies and simulation to perform in the best possible way. And now I would like to hand over the uh, presentation to my colleague, Paul Jerpe. Yes, thank you, Oscar. As uh, Oscar mentioned, my name is Paul Jerpe. Uh, I'm going first to say, talk a little bit about uh, our system, hybrid shaft generator system. Then I will go into a study that we have done. And at the end, we'll show you the results and some conclusions from that study as well. So if we start with the hybrid shaft generator system, it consists of several products. Uh, what you see here is the power takeoff take-in. Uh, this unit is uh, typically can be a synchronous unit where you have, brushed, uh, you have brushless and you have permanent magnet types. Uh, also, we have asynchronous machines. Further, your selection could be an inline machine, which is shown on the left-hand side here, or it could be a geared unit. Also, a part of the hybrid shaft generator system is the frequency converter. The choices here are an active front end, which is possible, or you could choose a direct front end. In the latter case, a direct front end, uh, the power take-in will not be possible. It will only be a power take-off system. Further, we have the transformer, of course, it could be water-cooled or air-cooled. Now, this system also uh, has possibility to connect other units to the frequency conver converter. That could be an energy storage, uh, which typically in this case means a battery or a, um, a supercapacitor. We could also uh, use a shore connection to the frequency converter. Uh, it could also be interfaced towards tunnel thruster, DEX machinery, and so forth that are power consumers or, co or producers. Now, all these choices that you have here depends really on what kind of operation profile you are having on your vessel, CAPEX requirement, efficiency, OPEX, uh, safety, and maintainability. All these points towards what, which type of solution you should have for your system. Now, uh, this system, I just talked about the power system. When it comes to hybrid shaft generator system, it also consists of a total solution, an integrated solution, where the power is only a part of it. So uh, the power take in, power take of the hybrid shaft generator system is a part of this lineup where you also have a power management or energy management system, but also an integrated automation system. And of course, also Echodice or a digital offering on top. All this connects the solution together, where it's all a vital part of the total system. Now, uh, the echo advisor that I showed on the previous slide is important for this system to work optimally. The echo advisor consists of two software, uh, software units or HMIs. We have the virtual human machine interface, which is typically a more simple user interface for the operator not to interfere with the operation. This is typically where you have a possibility to select between fuel efficiency, uh, optimal for fuel, main, uh, optimal for maintenance cost, uh, environment, and or even safety. While the onshore could be typically more used towards specific calculations like uh, fuel, concrete fuel savings, uh, and so forth. And there could be more analysis done on the onshore version. Now the echo advisor, uh, consists of a system that ties what I have previously shown all together. So how it typically works is that you have a certain operation that you are in. Now the system collects a lot of information from your power system, and then it gives you advice for how you should configure your system for an optimal performance. This optimal performance that the system gives you advice on, you go into the IS or PMS and you set this system up. And then again, the power plant will then be configured that way that the system is advising you to do. Now this goes in a, in a circle all the time. So it's all the time checks your operation and gives you advice on how you should operate it. I'm going to talk a little bit about a study that we have done. It's on a 14,000 TEU container. This is uh, sailing from China to Europe. 
with a few stops on its way. Uh, this is uh, a real travel or a real logged um, voyage for several vessels and we're taking the average of how they operate, typically operate. Now, if you look here, you can see on the right hand side, uh, you have the operation profile, where we typically see that it's most of its time is spending uh, in transit. Now, uh, when I say hey, transit slow, that means typically below 15 knots, and let's say between eight and 15 knots. During the operation, the total load, hotel load is about 5.1 megawatt, where the hotel base load is about a megawatt. And of course, a lot of the consumption on board is used on the reefers. On this specific case here, you can see it's 4.1 megawatt spent on reefers. Reefers is refrigerated containers. What the study looks into is that if you have a base vessel which uses uh, MGO, then the three cases we are looking into, well, the first case is to look at what if we introduce LNG. The second case is if you introduce a PTO system that I previously showed you and take away one auxiliary engine. And the last case is if you introduce a PTO only. Of course, you can mix case one and two, that means LNG and PTO and remove one auxiliary engine, or you can mix case one and three, that means you introduce LNG and then uh, introduce PTO without removing an auxiliary engine. Now let's look into the result of this study. What the study shows is that the LNG on the OPEX side contributes to about 15 to 20% OPEX savings. The mission side is uh, similar. We, we uh, contribute to about 15 to 20% CO2 equivalent savings. The reason why it says CO2 equivalent is because methane slip is also a part of the CO2 uh, emission. You can also see that the uh, CAPEX increases with about 25%. And when I said 25%, that means all the total vessel cost. This will lead in the business case to about 10 to 15% years payback time. Now, uh, Oscar will come more into uh, how the LNG is future proof uh, after I've uh, talked about my part of this, uh, this presentation. PTO contributes to OPEX savings of about one and a half to 2% while it contributes to a CO2 equivalent of savings of one to 3%. Now the PTO, if you look on the CAPEX side, if you remove an auxiliary engine, then actually you will reduce the CAPEX with about a half a percent. Obviously the business case will be very good at that time because you can see that if you introduce PTO and remove one auxiliary engine, we will lower the CAPEX and improve the OPEX. And that gives you actually a payback time of minus two years. If you introduce PTO only without removing uh, auxiliary engine, you can see that uh, contributes to CAPEX increase of about 1%, and it will lead to about two and a half years payback time. This is with a net present value of about 6% sorry, uh, six discount rate over 30 years. If you look into the fleet today, we can see that the container vessels uh, uh, on uh, in a range of 18,000, sorry, 8,000 to 24,000 TU, we can see that it's definitely an increase in LNG usage. You see that uh, today, uh, sorry, about in 2023, that is an increase of about, uh, so we reach about 30% of the fleet that will have, uh, sorry, not the fleet, but the new building will have, have uh, LNG as, or a dual fuel as, uh, as a fuel uh, option. Now we expect this basically, or possibility at least, to increase even further because the, the um, harbors are uh, offering uh, LNG in a larger degree than before. And this is still uh, increasing. And also with small scale LNG, the possibility to fuel your vessels with LNG has increased in the latter years. Now, if you look on the PTO, we can see that uh, the PTO is still quite few vessels. Uh, obviously, there are some mistakes in the latest year here in the data from Clarkson, because it seems here that it's virtually zero. But we know that there are a few PTO still in use in the container in this range, but still surprisingly few. So there is still a, a huge option uh, opportunity here to increase uh, the usage of PTO and save money. So this is basically a no-brainer to introduce. Now let me sum up. Um, so this system, the benefits for our customers are that substantial savings by taking energy from main shaft, where it's most efficient. 
It's a green solution because we utilize efficient and low emission power source. That means the two stroke engine. It also decreases the low or sorry, lower the methane slip, especially with a high pressure two stroke engine. It will massively reduce the running hours of auxiliary engine uh, because the energy is now taken over the main shaft. And that means the two stroke engine, which is running anyway. And uh, we may cut, that I showed, may cut number of installed auxiliary engines. And uh, we may also integrate to other consumers for a lower cost insulation. Okay, Oscar, then you can please take it on from here. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to continue to talk a little bit about how we can future proof the container vessels and uh, what kind of uh, scenario we see for the upcoming uh, fuel transition. You can say that this is driven by the need to reduce CO2 emissions and uh, IMO, they have already set their ambition level for uh, greenhouse gas reduction. They target the 50% reduction by the year 2050. And this is for the entire world fleet. Uh, taking into account that the number of vessel is likely to grow, uh, it actually means that for each individual ship, we need to reduce uh, the CO2 emissions per with about 70%. And this is such a big reduction that we cannot really achieve it with efficiency improvements alone. We will need to find a cleaner energy source and low carbon fuels. Already today, IMO has got some instruments in place to reduce CO2 emission. We have the energy efficiency design index uh, for new builds, and then we have the efficiency existing ship index and carbon intensity indicator for all types of ships, new and old. Um, and these are good instruments, but they are not enough to really reach the 50% target that IMO has set up. So we are most likely to see new regulations or other uh, kind of instruments or measures in order for shipping to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. And as mentioned earlier, to achieve the required reduction, we will need to look at low carbon fuels. We cannot achieve it with the current fossil fuels. Um, and there is a lot of work ongoing in the industry to explore and develop alternative fuels. Um, but so far, there is not really one clear winner here. Um, there is not one fuel that would be suitable for all types of ships. So, so most likely it will be a more diverse palette, uh, fuel palette when going forward into the future. There is not this one silver bullet. Another uncertainty is the time frame. As mentioned, we need regulation to really drive through this fuel transition. And this, these regulations are not yet in place and we don't know when they will be. So there is uncertainty about the fuel type and the timing. And, but if you look at low carbon fuel, there is a magnitude of, of different options out there. And, um, and you can see here, there are basically three main uh, pathways to low carbon fuel. And why we show this is because it's very important not only to consider the type of fuel, but also how the fuel is produced when we, when we consider how environmentally friendly a fuel is. Uh, one of these pathways, the blue one, is when we take fossil fuels and apply carbon capture to it. So then we can continue using diesel or LNG, but also ammonia and other new fuels can be produced with this blue way. Um, cost level could be attractive for these fuels, but there is a lot of controversy and discussion around how really environmentally friendly they are. So many people believe that the more likely options will come from renewable electricity or bioprocessing. So these pathways are um, the, the, maybe the main alternatives to look for. If you look at renewable el electricity or green fuels, um, here we basically take clean electric power and create hydrogen. This hydrogen can be used directly on board or converted into another energy carrier more suitable for ship use, such as uh, synthetic methane, uh, methanol, or ammonia. If we go down the bioprocessing uh, uh, pathway, uh, then we have options like uh, biodiesel or HVO. Uh, we can also use biogas, which is uh, similar to, to LNG. 
and then we have uh, biomethanol as a likely option. But which of these fuels are suitable for the container vessel market? Uh, on the blue side, it's mainly blue ammonia that come that is it could be an option. But as, as mentioned, there are question marks rega regarding the carbon capture feasibility. Um, on the green fuel side, we also have ammonia, green ammonia and synthetic methane as the main options. Hydrogen is too costly and complex to store on board these big container vessels. So that is very unlikely to be an option. Um, on the bio side, I think the main options are biogas or biomethanol. So we see that there are still a few likely options for the container industry. And that is part of the dilemma. Uh, we know there is this fuel transition coming, but we don't know when, and we don't know exactly what is the preferred fuel. Uh, so what should you buy today? You cannot really go out and buy an ammonia fuel ship and expect it to be competitive in today's market. We also know that there is this green agenda. There will be a stronger demand for clean transport, but how many of the customers are willing to pay for lower emissions already today? So that is part of this dilemma. What should you buy today to be competitive now, but also comply with the upcoming uh, more stringent uh, emission regulation? So our approach to this is to make a, a future-proof vessel. And here we show an example. This is our new 2000 TEU container feeder design. Here, we basically have applied a few features to make it future-proof. First, we put in a, a very well-connected ship, digitally connected with our Vessel Insight platform that enable us to put on a variety of applications today, but we can add on more and more in the future. Uh, another feature is that we suggest to start with LNG because that means that we can any day switch to uh, biogas or synthetic methane uh, without doing anything to the ship, because it's basically the same fuel. It's the same methane molecule. Um, so we have two low carbon options there. But in addition, we suggest uh, that we make a ammonia ready LNG system. This means that we can use the same LNG tank for storing ammonia in the future with a small conversion. Of course, this means that we also need to ensure that the engine can be converted to ammonia use later on in the future. Uh, we want to use clean power. So we have made the ship ready for wind power. Of, we can install it from the beginning. But this means that we want to put on a CP propeller. This is because the thrust varies a lot from one day to the other when you're using wind power. And the CP propeller is better to handle this uh, variation in thrust. And then we co connect this to a, a large PTO on, on the main shaft. But we don't only want the PTO, we want to extend the system to also be a PTI, power taken, so that we can feed in power and drive the ship electrically. And that is because we might see a need for zero emission operation in certain areas. And this we enable by putting in a big uh, a space reservation for a big battery uh, bank. And then we can operate in the ship on, on pure electricity in certain local areas for some time. Another space reservation we want to do is for additional fuel tanks, because if we want to shift from LNG to ammonia, we will need more space on board the vessel. So to summing up uh, the presentation here today, I think we have showed that we can show a introduce a very efficient and, uh, and uh, environmentally friendly solution. Our approach is that we start with the LNG, but we ensure that we have an ammonia ready system uh, because this will give, give fuel savings already today and we can shift to three different low carbon fuels in the future. Uh, then we wanna put in a hybrid shaft generator together with the PTO, PTI system to, to really ensure that we have the, the best uh, performing machinery out there with the best fuel consumption. And this we combine with our digital platform, Vessel Insight, to give all the kind of tools for the crew on board and on shore to operate the ship in the most efficient way. And then we support it with an extended fleet care lifecycle agreement that enable us to really give the best predictability on the service and maintenance of the vessel. 
And all this will end up with a future-proof solution that is highly competitive already today, but it can evolve and meet the, the demands of the future in the form of lower emissions and, and ability to adapt. So what we have introduced here is really a game-changing solution, game changing solution for the container market. And I hope it has been of interest to you here today. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, I would have a few notes here. One is that this webinar is being recorded and you will be receive a link to it so that you can watch it later on. And now we have the question and answer session that will be led by Leif Christian Beum. Thank you. Yes, hello everybody. Thanks for joining our container shipping webinar. Um, welcome to the last part, the Q&A session. Uh, we have received some questions, uh, which we will go through. Uh, due to some limited time, we may not open all, but we can take a, take a selection here. So if we look at the answers or the questions which has uh, come in here, uh, we have uh, the first, this goes to uh, Paul. Why doesn't more container vessels have PTI, PTO solutions? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it could be that before, because in the, let's say up until now, it is a quite advanced system. Uh, and for this reason now that they open up to integrate with a lot of other power uh, systems on board. And also since it's a little bit complex to know when to use it and know when, when, sorry, know when not to use it. Up until now, maybe that some have been a little bit skeptical about it, but uh, with the resolution that I showed you now, with a totally integrated solution, this should be uh, opening up for several others because you, you don't really have to think too much about it because Echo Advisor gives you exact uh, information about when you should use it and how you should operate it. So maybe that is the reason why uh, up until now, fewer has selected it. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, I think the next one also will be for you. Does your study take into consideration losses in the system? Yes, uh, it does. It uh, really is a very deep and thorough study where we actually uh, take into consideration dynamic losses in uh, equipment like the PTI, PTO, uh, the frequency converter, uh, the transformer and so forth. So all losses are dynamic. It's not straightforward with the fixed version. We have a, a model that shows dynamic losses depending on where the operating, operating point of the equipment actually is. So it is. Yeah. Then, um, as far as I can see, Oscar, the next question will be for you. Uh, you mentioned wind power in the slides. Can you please tell more about what type of wind solutions you have in mind? Yes, um, we are actually able to fit many different types of wind solutions to a vessel. And uh, for, but for this uh, specific container feeder, what we are looking at is a system of flattener rotors. So these uh, cylinders that you spin and create forward thrust. And uh, our design would feature at least two of them. And uh, our thinking is that uh, ideally they should be of a tiltable model. This would uh, this is to allow uh, them to be tiltable in port so that they are not in way of the container handling cranes. Uh, the benefit of this wind is that uh, on a good day, you can get uh, some part of your trust and, and uh, from this wind solution and uh, thereby reduce your fuel consumption. And, uh, but, but as mentioned, the key to wind solution is of course that you have a vessel that is prepared for it. So we wanna put in the CP propeller um, to really be able to handling, handle the variable thrust coming from the wind. And we also want to put in a good power management system that can that uh, accounts for this uh, wind solution so that it optimizes the, the machine in the right way. And then the next step is that you apply a weather routing system 
so that you can select the most ideal route for the vessel when, when using wind. So it's really about integrating this wind solution with the rest of the machinery that brings the big savings and, and big benefits. Yeah, then we have got a question from Mr. Kai Lindberg. As a small step in the right direction, how easy is it to convert a standard shaft generator into a hybrid one? Yeah, I guess that question goes for me. Um, yeah. Yes, uh, it is uh, since we have the drive there already, frequency converter there. It is, uh, uh, we have two options. We can have a kind of connect it directly to our DC link, or it could be via DC DC converter. Either way you choose, it is fairly straightforward and fairly easy to, to convert this. And our Kongsberg solution is already open uh, to straightforward integrate the battery, our battery straight to the drive and looking at the same lineup and so on. So that is, uh, it's, it's fairly easy. Uh, then we have one more question. Uh, I think we can fit that in. That's from Mr. Chris Jones. How is the space reserved for batteries or additional fuel tanks in your feeder vessels utilized before the vessel owner decides to install? Uh, Very yeah. I guess. Yeah, this is for me. I, uh, yeah, it's a good question. And uh, unfortunately, we didn't really have time to go into the design features of this new uh, container feeder vessel. This will be released uh, shortly. We will tell more about it. But uh, to really give you a hint, it, it's an open top container vessel. So basically, um, we have raised the whole con uh, cargo hold room uh, so that we have uh, space below the cargo hold for these uh, extra fuel tanks and batteries. Uh, so we actually have void space there. It might seem a little bit contradictory to what you do, but uh, container, our, our limit is of, of container uh, capacity is really more uh, defined by how many containers you can stack on each other. And uh, we can already stack the maximum amount in, in this design. So actually, container intake is not impacted at all by this uh, space reservation in this new design as we have. But okay. we will come out with more details about this later on in, in the fall. Thank you, Oscar. Uh, sorry to say, but time is running fast and we must round up this uh, session. Uh, as earlier mentioned, all questions received are noted and will be answered one by one, even if some is coming later and after we hang up. We thank all participants for joining today's seminar. As earlier mentioned, questions will be answered. P please feel free to contact us uh, if any comments or questions to the presentations given. Thank you, stay tuned and hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.